Okay, so when um, Dr. Barrett asked me to come out and um, spend some time with you, she gave me about one hour to come up with a title for what I was going to say. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. About an hour. <laughs> and um, so I came up with this title, and partly because of the project that we're doing, it really felt like it would um, express what we're trying to do through Touching Home in China. And so I submitted it to her, and she liked it. And so when I started thinking about how I would begin to share my thoughts on this, I began to be much more expansive than just thinking about our project. I thought it would be really important to maybe put what we're doing in a much broader context, because you all are studying communication. And at the heart of communication, I believe, is story. So if we read this here, I thought this was a really good way of kind of bringing us into it. Human beings are natural storytellers. They cannot help telling stories, and they turn things that aren't really stories into stories because they like narratives so much. Everything, faith, science, love, needs a story for people to make it, to find it plausible. So this was written in the New Yorker in an article called, Can Science Explain Why We Tell Stories? And I'm not sure we need science to explain it. I think we pretty much understand that at our core, we're pretty natural storytellers. But I came up with two other explanations, which I thought I'd share. Um, stories can be a way for humans to feel that we have control over the world. They allow people to see patterns where there is chaos, and meaning where there is randomness. Humans are inclined to see narratives when there are none because it can afford meaning to our lives, a form of existential problem solving. So that's trying to look at it from the psychological perspective of why we have a need to both tell and to hear stories and to frame aspects of our lives as stories. The last one came from Wired Magazine, which is really about the tech world. So that gives a slightly different perspective, but it ends with the notion of anthropologists telling us that storytelling is central to human existence, that it's common to every known culture. So here in this room, we have a number of people from different cultural backgrounds, but yet they would contend that we're sort of wired you know, to tell stories, that it's part of what makes us human. So that involves a symbiotic exchange between the teller and the listener, where we learn to negotiate in infancy, just as the brain detects patterns in visual forms of nature, so a face, a figure, a flower, and in sound, so too it detects, detects patterns in information. So here it says we use stories to make sense of our world and share that understanding with others. So here are hieroglyphics, going back to obviously Egypt and the pyramids. And here is the way that people have come to understand what these symbols mean. So in these symbols, there was an effort to tell a story. And that story would often be uh, revolving around the life of the person who was entombed in that area. I don't know if any of you have gone to the Museum of Fine Arts, have you, in Boston? If you do, they have an incredible exhibit of Egyptian hieroglyphics. They have a lot of some of the tombs, the stone tombs in which people were buried. And it's really wonderful. I know as a child, I went there and I spent a lot of time just walking around them and trying to figure out what is the story that's being told. Not that I had at the time this little language thing next to me, but you still can begin to discern, you know, characters and symbols and meaning. But the notion is that they wanted to preserve a story of a life just as they were preserving the body inside the tomb. So here's the cave dwellers. Now, I don't have a breakdown of the symbols and what they mean here. But I don't think it takes us much to sort of begin to look at this and realize that there's a story being told in these characters. Probably if each of us looked at this, we'd come up with a slightly different story. But um, nevertheless, 
There are discernible figures, there's discernible animals, there's some form of action that's taking place. So again, we're telling a story. Okay, so now <coughs> we're gonna talk about story and remember in some of those, we talked about the notion of sound as being a way to tell story. So I'm gonna play for a moment um, this story, which is really told through a song and a spiritual. So here we go. I think, I think that this is gonna go. Where's the sound? So Janice, help me out here. Oh, oh here. Gosh. Okay. Oh, that's bizarre. I, don't I think we can do it. Oh no. All right, well, we do need the sound for later on. So I'm just gonna let it go and we'll see if we can find the sound because I have this plugged in. Oh, here it is. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. What, where'd it go? And really what those spirituals represented at that time was a way for slaves who were prohibited really from going to school, from being educated. It was a way for them to continue to tell their stories to each other and to give themselves a sense of that resilience to kind of keep moving on. So a lot of the spirituals that come from there are really a way of telling each other's stories. Um, during a time that was, you know, it tried everything about them um, and their spirit. So um, that also is a way of telling story through sound. Next, I'm going to turn to an example of, and this is a, for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we're going to listen to just a little bit of a fireside chat because, in fact, leaders often tell us stories and they do it in a way that tries to reassure us um, that we're going to be okay. In this case, I thought this quote was really interesting. I never saw him, but I knew him. So to know someone is to have this feeling that they understand you and you understand them, which really is the essence of why we share story. Can you have forgotten how, with his voice, he came into our house, the president of these United States, calling us friends? So again, we're back to this notion of how he came into, one sec, I wanna just show you. Yeah, so you see people gathered around, you know, listening on the radio as a family and him surrounded by this pack of microphones. And it was though he was speaking directly to them. So I'm just gonna play a little so you get a flavor of his voice and what it sounded like. Let's see. It's supposed to play, so we'll see. Okay. Well, so maybe it's not. Maybe it's not going to. What did you press before? Do you remember? Uh, it, should, it should have played, it should be playing. But I'm just gonna read you, uh, because I'm gonna read you a couple of lines from it, just to give you a sense of how he was trying to communicate with them. He began by saying, my friends, I wanna talk to you for a few minutes. 
with the people of the United States about banking, to talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for making deposits and the drawing of checks. So he's really beginning to invite everyone into this conversation as he comes into it. And he just begins by making it very simple and very, very simple language. First of all, let me state the simple fact that when you deposit money in a bank, the bank does not put that money into a safe deposit vault. So what he's beginning to do, and I would encourage you to go and listen online to this, he begins the story of what happens to your money as you put it in. So he's not just telling you about some policy that he's declaring. He's inviting you into it by telling you a story of what happens to your money when it goes into a bank. And those, those exchanges that happened with him were ones that really, in many ways, people argue was what kept America going during what was then the Great Depression um, and those fireside chats. And that's what they were called, this notion of gathering around a fireside and, and sharing story. I'm gonna now go to a slide that shows what's the probably the most challenging, probably human story of our time, and that is the mass migration of refugees. And this is showing you a photograph of refugees that are just literally marching from a place they knew that they feel they need to leave to a place they don't know, and where they know when they get there, the only thing they know is they're gonna be strangers. They're gonna be foreigners. So how is it that they're gonna be able to tell their story and who's going to do that for them? What I wanna do is show you now a quick video clip that was done by, has anyone heard of the, um, the then Chinese artist An Weiwei? An Weiwei? Ai Weiwei, Ai Weiwei, thank you, Maya. So that arguably is the challenge of our lives, as we're gonna be seeing more and more migration for any number of reasons, whether it's because of climate change and the migration that's forced from that, or whether it's political migration there's no doubt that we're going to be seeing this and so we're going to have to figure out at least i would argue how to tell each other stories about our lives so that we begin to understand people not as foreigners but we come to understand them as sharing a human experience and try to find what's similar about ourselves and not concentrate so much on what keeps us apart and what has made us different because I think as uh, he's arguing in this film, this is truly what our world is going to become. And Europe already is clearly facing that. As someone who's lived in Europe a lot, you're certainly aware of that, I'm sure, of what's been happening there. Um, and certainly in the Middle East and in your country, there are certainly tensions that exist in that region over the question of whose land is whose and whose religion ought to dominate and cultural differences that exist. So that's one thing I just wanted to bring up in terms of story. Story is a very powerful tool to begin to bridge those, to bridge those differences. I'm gonna just begin now to pull you in a little bit to our project, which I hope now you'll have a sort of context for understanding what we're gonna do. It was mentioned earlier that I worked for Time Magazine, and this is one of the cover stories that I did for Time Magazine. And the whole notion of it was, this was in 1988, and the idea was that we were beginning as a nation to think about the well-being of children. We had done this before in various times. In the early 60s, we thought a lot about poverty in children. Here we were thinking about a lot of the changes that were happening in our economic structure and the rest, and I just felt it was really important to be able to tell this story of what was happening in America through the eyes of children. And so the story that I suggested and ended up spending nearly six or seven months being able to go out and report was the idea that this story would be told with no 
expert, no adult expert voices. The experts would be the children themselves. And I would tell their stories by literally living with them, spending time with them, riding the school bus with them, going to church with them, going to temple with them, going wherever they went. <coughs> I would go and I would, I would spend the night sleeping in their house. I would be with them 24 hours. If there was an adult who would be part of this story, it would only be someone who was intimately involved with the child, whether it might be a teacher, a parent, a <coughs> sibling. And so that was the premise that I went out to do, and I found five children in different parts of America that I thought represented a pretty good way of telling this story of childhood in America today. So this has always been something that I have looked to <coughs> as a guide for me to think about. The value of telling the stories and the way to tell stories. Cut out the voices that are irrelevant. The ones who think they understand it, but they aren't actually the ones who are living that story. So here we go. This is the story called Touching Home in China in Search of Missing Girlhoods. And this really is the story, excuse me, that I began to tell you earlier of Maya's journey, going back to the place in China where she um, probably was born, but maybe not. Um, we don't know that for sure, but we do know it's the place where she was found before she was taken to the orphanage. And here she is. Maya, you wanna point out which one you are? Uh, Bottom corner. <laughs> mm -hmm. The bottom corner is is Maya, and this is on the day that I met her when she was nine months old. And in the crib right behind her is a girl who came to be known as Jenny. And Jenny and Maya and some of the other girls in some of the other cribs there grew up to know each other through childhood because they all came back from China together as a group and they came to know each other as they were in this country. This is the picture I received where I began to realize that this was the child who was gonna be my daughter. I think this was taken when you were maybe about three months old. Yeah, you don't know. But this was the story that began our, this was the picture that began our story and you can imagine that just receiving this visual image, and it would be another five or six months until I'd be able to go to China to adopt her, that I began to create you know, a sense of story about what our lives would be together. There she is, home, and that was at a welcoming party that we had for her when she arrived. Okay, so here goes our story where we're talking about going back to China. This was when you were seven? I think you were seven, yeah. And um, we went back and at the very end of our trip, we went and did sort of the homeland trip. We went to Beijing and saw all of the monuments and we went to Shanghai, we went to the major cities. And then at the very, very end, we went back to the city where Maya was in her orphanage, Shangzhou. And then one day we came out to the town that was part of her records. <coughs> and I have to say, uh, you can speak if you like, Maya, but this was not an enjoyable day for you, I don't think. This was your mother's <laughs> idea more than yours. Is that fair to say? I think so, yeah. And Maya did not yet speak Chinese, and she was really, I think, too young to have the ex experience. But this experience of just being there in her town for this day, and you can see the number of people just turning to stare at us. Um, and we left very quickly after that. Um, this led to me when she was 16 years old, suggesting that maybe now that she'd studied Chinese and done Chinese dance, and maybe it was time if she wanted to, to go, um, to go back and to meet the girls and to set up this trip that we eventually, that she eventually did. And to my delight, partly surprised, she said yes. And so she and Jenny went back. So these are, why am I showing you this picture? Because these are the storytellers 
that help us to tell this story. Um, this is a woman who became the videographer for the trip. Her name is Jocelyn Ford, and she had been a storyteller for National Public Radio. She had been with Marketplace, which is a business show, in Beijing for 13 years and spoke Mandarin fluently. Oh. And she also had left that job to do a documentary, and so she became our videographer. This is Jane Liu, and Jane was um, the translator and someone who could kind of help us to negotiate our way um, through China. And this woman is Fong Yuan. And Fong Yuan is someone who I had met at Harvard. And here is Fong Yuan on the front page of the New York Times. Fong Yuan left journalism because she felt it wasn't a way to really begin to tell the story of what was happening with women in China. And she became uh, really a social activist and began to work in academia, began to work in nonprofit areas in telling women and girls stories. So when we were going over to do this story, I invited Fong Yuan to come down and spend some time with us and with some of the girls who were in Maya's town. Here you see Fong Yuan on the front page of the New York Times on the day that five women were released from prison after being uh, held for 41 days in China because of their activism on women's rights issues. Um, I want to, so I don't know why this is happening. Okay. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a sense that um, the people who we had as storytellers were people who knew a lot about China, were able to be guides for, for us and for Maya um, to be able to go back and to really tell this story with some level of um, authenticity. But, and remember through, through the eyes of children, these girls that you see here, these are the ones who are really the ones who tell the story. You can see Jenny and Maya in the middle. The six girls who loop around the side are the girls from the hometowns, from the places that Jenny and Maya's lives began in China. And these girls are the ones who become the narrators, along with Maya and Jenny, of the story that we're telling. So it really becomes a cross-cultural conversation about girlhood. You might recognize Maya there. And this is um, in uh, the second of our six stories that we do in our project. And this is the one called Touching Home. And this is, I think, your first day back in Shashi with Chen Chen, walking around, I think, second day. But anyway, it's early on. So um, this is how our story begins. And maybe I'll just read it to you, and then we will look at a video about it. So we're really asking this question. Can a teenager feel at home in a place she has no memory of living? A place where she recognizes no one, yet in the faces around her finds an unaccustomed familiarity. Maya Shaolatki, abandoned as a newborn in China's rural Shashi town, then adopted as a baby to grow up an American, has come home to find out. Though her <coughs> eyes, skin, and height match those of the teens she meets, Subtle differences stand out in Maya's body language, posture, and stride, and in the way she weaves her silky hair into a braid she's draped over her shoulder. Then we write about a walk that she takes with Chen Chen, and now I'm gonna show you a video of her encounter with these three women who recognize her as a foreigner. They've never seen her here, and they're very curious to find out who is this girl who has shown up? Oh, 
，像他女儿，像不像？女儿不嘛？And but by sharing stories with one another, they begin to find their comfort zone and their place. So again, whether you're going into public relations or communication, I guess what I'm trying to convey on all of this is that look for the story that you're going to be able to pull out that is going to convey the essence of what your message is. If you just try to give a message without any kind of a storyline or a narrative behind it, I think that's where you don't connect with people because there's so much bombarding people today, so much coming at them, that unless there's something that gives them a reason to care about what you're telling them, and I think arguably people care when it's about someone else and there's a reason that they should care about that person, even if they are a refugee who they don't think they're ever going to meet. Um, but you heard the refugees in that refugee camp saying, just let us tell our story. Let us show people who we are. Let us not just be characterized from a distance in terms of being the stranger, being the foreigner, being the invader. Let us tell you who we are. Let us share our story. Did it feel like home to you? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, can I feel at home in a place that I've never been to? Surprisingly, I, I did feel very comfortable in the town, but yes, there were times where I was very aware that I was the foreigner. Why did you feel at home? I don't know, I connected with, with seeing people who, who looked like me and um, being in a place that was just so natural. There was trees and there was flowers everywhere. And I mean, everyone that I met was so kind and welcoming. Um, there was people that I would, you know, just pass by on the street and they'd say, oh, they'd want to get to know me or help me in finding relatives. Let me ask you something else. It's easy to assume that when you come from an affluent Western country and you go to rural China, that you are unwittingly um, transmitting to these Chinese girls who are not given up for adoption how well you've done because you grew up in so-called wealthy America. I know that wasn't your intent. How did you deal with that perception if you faced it? Yeah, that, that question definitely came up a lot. I was often told, yeah, you're so lucky, everything's perfect. You know, in some ways, yes, I am extremely lucky. Um, you know, I am in college now. I can see my, my future ahead of me. But at the same time, it, it did kind of, you know, hit me in, in the wrong way. Just hearing that I was always so lucky and everything was perfect. Because, um, you know, I think there are parts of my life where I do struggle and where America, you know, isn't, isn't always, you know, what they believe it to be. But for this trip, it really wasn't about, you know, me coming in as this um, like tourist on a high horse. It was, it was really about getting to know them on a very, you know, human, personal level. Um, as, you know, teenage girls just the same. It was such a raw experience where I was learning from them. Okay. So, Maya, I think that I'm going to ask you if you would, and I think you said, well, I show pictures of what Shashi looked like, so you get a sense of the flowers and sort of the beauty and the green that she saw there. Um, would you read your essay that you wrote when you came back? I think I have a copy of it. Yeah, here. I forgot about that interview. You forgot about what? That interview. Oh, well, what did you think of it? I never heard it before. Oh, okay. <laughs> here you go. <clears throat> All right. So there you go. Okay, so why don't you stand up and read it, and, or I'll, sit down? I'll yeah. sit. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I guess I will start by saying, I wrote this back in high school. It was, I wrote it and used it as my entrance essay. Um, so it's been a while since I've seen this, but I wanted to read it because I think it's a really good, kind of concise way that I've thought about the trip and looked back on it, and I wrote it right after coming back, so it brings me back to that mindset. Um, the first nine months of my life are a mystery. 
tiny jade bracelet and a photograph of an inexplicably circular face on top of a torn red sweater make up my memory album. A few stapled pages of ambiguous papers constitute my birth record. I do know that I was found in Shashi, a farming town of flowers and trees. Though I was nervous about shattering the stable but fragile image I had created in my mind about those nine months, this past August I went to Shashi and began to crack through that tableau and experience what my life could have been. There, I met the girls I could have grown up with, and with them, visit the places where I would have spent each day. I was overwhelmed by simultaneous feelings of deep connection and unbridgeable distance. As we struggled to know the chasms created by language and culture, I found familiarity in their faces and the trees enveloping us. So, what are you? The girls asked me. You look Chinese on the outside, but you are American on the inside. At first, I detested this description. If the substance of my being is not Chinese, I might as well be white. Once content with describing myself as Chinese American, now I was hit with its vagueness. Where do I belong between being Chinese and becoming American? In some ways, my new friends were right. My many fragmented conversations during the three weeks we were together affirmed the differences in how our minds have developed to perceive the world. You are so lucky you have no discipline, leaving school, and freedom. The Shashi girls would say with certainty and envy, all we get to do is study. I felt guilty about my luck and the truth in their words. Still, their idealistic views about America and the ease of life perplexed me. They had quickly dismissed my out-of-school activities and community service as lacking real learning. Yet, soon I realized how their understanding of smart contrasts with mine. Being smart is the high ranking a teacher gives them. Studying is their only way of getting there. These tight borders command the childhood. I permeated these borders as we talked about growing up, gender roles, equality, and relationships. No one before had given them the space to talk about such topics. As a girl born in Shashi and living in America, I was the most foreign person the girls had ever met. They never come in contact with anyone who looked different than they do. When I told them about the friends I have who look different than I do, they were astonished. Being with them gave me a deeper appreciation for the diversity that my life in America gives me. For those I met in Shashi, family, blood, and ancestry. Do you not know your real parents, strangers would ask me soon after we met, sympathetic and eager to help me find mine. When is your birthday? What orphanage are you from? To me, their words, real mother, sit heavy in my mind. Even if I had spoken their dialect fluently, I'm not sure I could have explained. I have a real mother who raised me and loves me. My biological family might not be whom I romanticized them to be, and finding such strangers would not instantly conjure love. Instead, it was in the welcoming care that countless strangers showed me, in sucking watermelon slices in both my hands, pulling a comb through my hair, and attempting to cool me in 110 degree heat, <laughs> that I found home in Shashi, and that was enough. So, so that's it. Lovely, very yeah. nice. So, um, interestingly, I think Maya just mentioned to you that um, one of the great differences that she discovered was when the girls talked as teenagers about what it was like to be in school and what their lives, what, was, what were the expectations of them. I think as many of you realize, not only are you students coming from foreign countries to study in America, but a number of students are now coming from China to do that in America. And for them, there's one experience in particular that's really challenging, because it's something they've never been asked to do before, and that is to write what Maya just read to you, a personal essay. This is not something that they're ever asked to do in their school. It's more learning what the teacher tells them and being sure that they get it right on the test when they give it back. And so with the advent of coming to Western schools and the expectation that they must do this kind of essay. There's a lot of tutors making a lot of money over there teaching them how to do it. But one of the things that the New York Times did in China was to publish some essays that were submitted by the Chinese students because this is such a new thing for them. And Maya's essay, which got shared with them, is the only one that they published from an American student here 
as part of their um, essay thing. And they, they did it in Mandarin and in English. So I just wanted to kind of share that to talk about what Maya just mentioned. Congratulations, Maya. So that That's was quite, quite an accomplishment. accomplishment. I should add that I, I don't mean to you know, glorify this education system that we have here, no. because I think that there's many, many deep <coughs> problems with it, especially in early education, mm -hmm. um, but just a reflection upon differences in how, especially in high level education, I saw differences in style of education. Right, and that's the thing that I would really like to point out because I'm going to open it up for questions in just a moment. But if you do have an interest in our project, I think one of the most interesting stories that you might want to look at is the learning about learning mm -hmm. one that we do. And for exactly the reason that Maya is um, you know, bringing up here, because, and you'll see here that we have six stories, and learning about learning is our fourth one. And in that, what we do is really walk through what the girls learn from each other about their schooling. And one of the things that I've noticed, because I know a lot of faculty who are teaching in colleges today, and one of the things they often talk about is when students come from foreign countries, into classrooms here, I think they often feel as though they're not necessarily welcomed in, in a sense by the other students because there isn't the effort or the initiative to begin to help those students who are now sharing the same classroom to understand the cultural differences that those students bring into that experience of learning. They learned very differently. It's not that one system is inherently better than the other, but that we understand that culture plays a role in how we are taught and how we learn and what our expectations are. So in this story, learning about learning, we try to do the best we can to take you through some of that, through videos with teachers talking about the learning experience there, with the students talking about their learning experiences. So if you are intrigued by this and interested, I do think that would be the most interesting one for you to explore um, in this. You're certainly welcome to do any. It's totally open source. It's free to the world. Anyone can come in. We put no paywall, no registration, because we want it to be as open and as accessible as possible to anyone. So we built a website for it and created this. <clears throat> and here we have lesson plans that go with each one. And so just to share with you on learning about learning, we do, the, we do these lesson plans thematically. So here's the question that we raise with our question about learning. The big idea is how does learning reflect a nation's cultural values? So that's not only, as Maya says, about America and how it reflects our cultural values in terms of how you know, we go about educating our students and what the emphasis that we put on, but we raise for you guiding questions and then we present opportunities to dig further into these topics and in fact give you the resources to do it. So we've developed this not only as a storytelling, but also we've provided lessons for teachers from the level of middle school through university with the resources that we've given. So I'm not going to belabor that, but I do think that I'd like to play for you, um, where is Touching Home in China, there it is. I'd like to just play for you the final video that uh, we close out this section on the Girls Reflect, which I think um, added to Maya's essay will give you a sense of her experience there. I don't know that you've seen this video in full, Maya. I showed it to you earlier without the narration. So I think you're going to be seeing it now. Okay. Well, this will be a surprise to Maya, too. She's having just gotten back from Tanzania. I don't think she's seen any of this. Okay. So, okay. So here we go. And I think what you're going to see in this is you're going to see her in the same marketplace where she felt so much a stranger and so much you know, a place that she didn't feel she belonged. Well, and here she is. Hey, Maya. Hey, Maya. Hey, Maya. Hey, Maya. Hey, Maya. With her friend 
monkey. Maya feels at home in Shashi's market, recording memories of a visit she will never forget. When she was seven, I brought her here. People stared at us and Maya wanted to go. Now she's back, feeling at ease. suggests they find out if Maya was born in this hospital. Maya didn't come to Shashi to find her birth family, but this doesn't stop hospital staff from seeing if their birth records might offer some clues. There is one more stop Maya wants to make before returning to America. Always to be a part of who she is, no matter how far away adventures take her.